Hey everyone, welcome to our tutorial on how SFML runs. Before we get into the basics of drawing sprites or any of that, we need to cover a few basic concepts that will explain how SFML runs in our C++ programs. So we're going to first learn about the window, then we're going to cover the basics of a game loop, and then we'll learn about drawing items onto the window. So let's head to the code and get started. Alright, so just a few things before we begin. Um, I have a file here called oldcode.cpp. What I'm going to be doing at the end of each section is taking all the code that we write and dumping it into oldcode.cpp. That way we can clear out the stuff in main.cpp and have an archive of all the stuff that we wrote previously. Okay, so that's why old code is there. The second thing is that whenever we go to run something, um, because I'm doing my, or I'm writing my code on a Mac, I'm gonna be running the Mac specific commands. That means my compile command will look something like this, okay? And my run command will look like this. If you're using a Mac, obviously you can copy the same stuff, but if you're using a PC, make sure you're running your PC specific compile and run commands. Those should have been covered in the installation with a PC video. Okay, so just make sure you're keeping that in mind. Things will be slightly different depending on your system. Otherwise, the actual code that we write will be exactly the same. Okay, so I just want to breeze through this really quickly um, so that we can get right into the actual drawing of sprites and all that good stuff. So the first things that we need to cover is going to be the render window. So this window here is what we use to actually draw items to the screen. First of all, this is kind of like our game window. We don't really care, at least in this course, about anything outside of this window. Some games might require that, not the case with us. So basically, if you click outside of the window, it doesn't matter. It's as if that click never happened, but everything that occurs within the window is going to be a part of our particular game. Now, you can see that this is a render window type object. Okay, this is part of the SFML. That's why you see SF uh, with the two colons and then render window. It is set up with a video mode type object and the video mode takes in a width and a height. Okay, so that's what these numbers represent, the width and height in pixels. It also takes in a title. So if we were to run this, um, which we should have done already, you'll see something like this. Okay, um, we can actually make that a bit bigger so we can actually see the title. So we see the title SFML works and this is our window. Okay, so this is the render window here. We can actually make this bigger or smaller, um, in which case the pixel size of the window is actually changing. But um, where possible, we should avoid doing this because it can lead to unexpected behavior. Okay. Now, there's also um, this circle shape, and we're drawing it down here. We'll come back to that in just a minute here. Okay, so we know everything's drawn to the window. Basically, our main game loop is going to run as long as this window is open. So the main game loop is where the three main parts of the game happen. The first thing is going to be to take in user interaction. The second is going to be to update the game state. And then the third is going to be to draw whatever we need to the screen. And basically, as long as the program is running, we're just going to cycle through this loop and continually update the stuff over and over again. Most game loops, I think, by default, run at 60 frames a second, which means they run 60 times per second. That's not always the case, and actually you can have a bit of fine-tuned control over that. For now, we're going to leave it at its default value. So in our case, our game loop is just simply running as long as a window is open. Sometimes you want to make it a bit more complex, but we'll not do anything different than this. Okay, so within our main game loop, we're doing one thing uh, first, which is just polling for events. Then we would be updating the state after this. And then finally, we're actually drawing everything to the screen. So we're only listening for the single event right now, and that is checking to see if the user closed the window. If they did, then we do window.close. We break out of the loop and we exit the program. Okay, um, we'll get more into polling for events later on, but for now, this is the only one we're listening to. Again, we have no state to update, so we skip that. And then the third step here is to draw stuff to the window. Now, this is actually a three step process. The first is going to be to wipe the window clear, that way, we don't get frames from previous uh, runs of the window. Then we draw whatever we want onto the window, and then finally, we display the window. So, in our case here, we only have one item that we're drawing, and this is a circle shape. We're not really going to be covering shapes in this course because we don't really need them for our game. For the most part, we'll be using sprites and texts. Okay, so um, this is probably going to be the only exposure we'll get to shapes. 
Anytime we want to draw something to the window, you just select the window you want to draw to, window.draw, and then you pass in whatever item you're trying to draw here. And then again, window.display will actually show the window, and we need to continually do this as long as the game is running. So um, a common misconception is that you should only really need to draw the shape once, okay? And that's not the case because we need to draw it every single frame. This is because perhaps the, sh the position of a particular shape or item changed, maybe its size changed. Okay, so we need to constantly be updating with each frame, each run of the loop, we need to draw things again, okay? Otherwise, that is pretty much the basics of what we wanted to cover here. Just wanted to talk about what the window is. As long as we know that this is the object we'll be drawing everything to, then we should be good to go. We're not going to worry about shapes moving forward, so we can actually get rid of that and that. We talked about the game loop, which is just going to continually check for three things. It's going to first check for user interactions or any events. It's then going to update the state, and it's going to finish by drawing or rendering everything to the screen. Then we talked about the three stages of that drawing, which is going to be to clear the window, draw any shapes onto it or any sprites or anything, and then finally to display the window. Okay, so that's it for now. In the next section, we're going to be actually working with sprites that will be loading in textures, drawing sprites to the screen so that we can actually have uh, some interesting functionality in our game. Okay, so that's it for now. Thanks for watching and see you guys in the next one. What's up guys? Welcome to our tutorial on sprites and textures. Here we're going to get a quick introduction into what sprites and textures are and how we can use them to display images in our SFML programs. So the first task is going to be to start up a new project and add some images into that project through an images folder. Then we're going to create a texture and the corresponding sprite and then we're just going to draw it to the screen. For those of you who have experience with SFML and sprites, this will just be pure review. If you are brand new to SFML, then this will be a quick introduction into what sprites are and how they work. So let's head to our text editor and get started. Okay, so you can see I've got Visual Studio Code open here. Feel free to use a different text editor if you like. Um, just know that I'm going to be using this particular text editor for the rest of the course and I'm also going to be using Terminal to run the code. So the first thing that I want to do is actually start up a new folder. I already have one set up on my desktop, it's called a roguelike game with SFML. Right now it contains a folder with some images. So these are the five images that we're going to be using throughout the remainder of this course in various parts of our game. You should have access to this images folder in your source codes. So if you don't have a folder started up already, feel free to start one up now, call it whatever you'd like, and once that's done, we'll go ahead and open that up in our project here. So I'm just going to open the folder, and I'm just going to select that one there. Okay, so once that is done, I'm going to start up a new file, and I'm going to call this main.cpp, so I'm just going to go new file here. Let's just close that one up. I'm going to save this as main.cpp. doesn't matter too much what you call it. I would recommend you call it main. Um, just make sure it has a CPP extension. Also, the Visual Studio Code needs a specific compiler or at least a legitimate compiler. So I'm just going to make sure that's legitimate as well. I'm going to go into settings, command palette, edit configurations, and I'm just going to make sure, yep, clang is selected. So just go to the compiler path and specify the list to where your compiler is stored or rather the path to where it's stored. Okay, so once that's done, we'll close it up and we can go back to main. All right, so now we're going to just add in the initial kind of startup code that you'll need in pretty much every SFML program. Just gonna quickly breeze through this. So we're going to start by including sfml slash graphics.hpp. Uh, this again is kind of just review from the intro to SFML section, which you should have seen already. I'm gonna start up our main function. This is the entry point into the program. I'm just going to add a window height and a window width, so we'll set a window height and width of, I think, about 400 should do it. Window width, 400. This way we have a 400 by 400 square um, that we're going to use to display everything on. I'm now going to create the window itself, so we'll do an SF render uh, window. Okay, and this is going to be, I'll just call this window. This is going to need a video mode, so I'm just going to do SF video mode and I'm going to set the window width and then the window height equal to this variables. It's also going to want a title as well, so I'm just going to pass in a string here. I'm just going to call this roguelike. 
okay, feel free to call it something more descriptive if you like. So essentially we have a width and a height of 400 pixels and we're going to use this window to display everything. Now just a heads up, depending on the size of your screen, this window may appear very small or very large. And actually the first time I coded this game, I built it in a different laptop, which had I think fewer pixels than this one. So it's gonna appear small here, but was actually a perfect size on that one. So feel free to kind of play around with the sizing. Essentially, I chose 400 by 400 because I want each of my cells to be 50 by 50, each of my tiles, and I want it to be an eight by eight grid. We'll get more into that a little bit later though. Okay, so to complete the setup, I'm going to open up my while loop. I'm going to say while the window is open. Okay, I'm going to start polling for events. I'm going to say SF event. I'm just gonna call this event. Okay, I'm going to check to see when, uh, or as long as this is polling events, I'll do window.poll event. I'm going to pass in that event. Okay, and then I'm just going to check for close events. So I'm just going to say if event.type is equal to sf event closed. In this case, I'm just going to close up my window. Okay, so again, uh, this is all we'll look for for now is the close event, just to make sure that the program runs smoothly and stops running as soon as we close things up. Later on, we're going to add additional button handlers for the directional buttons, but for now, we'll leave it alone. Okay, so once that is done, we're just going to, after this first while loop, but still within this, the outer while loop, do the drawing itself. So we'll do a window.clear to begin with. So we'll make sure everything is wiped from the window and we're going to do a, whoops, a window.display. Okay, we don't have anything to draw just yet, but we will put the drawing functionality between these two calls. Okay, so that actually brings us to the drawing itself and the kind of purpose of this tutorial. So if you have not used sprites before, a sprite is essentially a two-dimensional bitmap image and is used to display essentially images in our programs. In this case, we're just going to load in any one of these textures. Um, we're going to have to load it into a texture first and then we set a sprites texture to be that and then that will be used to display the image itself. So choose any one of these that you like. Um, let's just go enemy for now because, you know, why not? And we're going to start by loading in the texture. So we're going to make a call to uh, texture. Oh, actually, I guess we should probably first create the texture. So we'll do an SF texture, texture uh, like so. Okay, so this is just going to create an object of type SF texture. Now we're going to um, set the texture from a file. So we'll do if uh, texture dot load from file. And we're just going to pass in the texture name. Actually, we should say if not texture dot load from file. We'll pass in that file name in a second. We just want to return zero and exit. Okay, um, so we're going to pass in the file path. We need the folder name as long as, as well as the image name. So we'll do images slash, and then in this case we'll do, I guess we can do the enemy.png, although it doesn't matter for now. This is really just a demonstration. Okay, so we have the texture loaded into, or rather we have the image loaded into the texture at this point. Now we need to create a sprite and set the texture. So we're going to say SF sprite, and um, whoops, sprite like so, we'll just call the sprite for now. We're going to set the texture like this, sprite.setTexture. And we're just going to pass in that texture, which we just loaded up above. Okay, so now that we have the texture loaded in, we can draw it on our window. So we can say window.draw, and we can load in that sprite. We don't actually draw the texture itself, we draw the sprite, and the sprite has a texture attached to it. So we can actually, at this point, go ahead and save this and we can go ahead and run it. So I'm just going to turn to my terminal, uh, navigate to my correct location. So in this case, this is the desktop. This is the roguelike game with SFML. If you can see, if I do LS, I have the images and I have my main.cpp. So I have to actually compile this first. I'm just going to enter in my compile command here. Um, just make sure that it is going to correspond with your CPP name. So in this case, main.cpp will create an executable called main, okay? So we're just going to do that. I'm going to run it by doing dot slash main. Okay, and as you can see, I get my window here. So like I said before, the 400 by 400 window was actually perfect for a slightly uh, screen with fewer pixels, so lower pixel density. If you're finding that this is a bit small, you can actually just expand the window. Alternatively, you can set a different height for or a different size for these guys if you'd like. But you can see that our little sprite is rendered here.
All right, so this is the basics of loading in textures and displaying sprites on a screen. There's a few steps. Again, first we have to create a texture, load it from a file, uh, making sure that you are passing the correct file path. Sometimes this fails randomly, so you should be handling it appropriately. You then have to create a sprite and set the texture here. There are a few other properties we can set. For example, we can set the size of the texture, setting a texture rect. We can set the texture to be smoothed, but we'll get more into that a bit later. Um, after that, when we are actually drawing things, we need to make sure that we're drawing it within the while window is open loop. We are going to first wipe the window. We're then going to draw any sprites that we want, and then window.display will display the final window. Okay, so that's the basics of using textures and sprites in SFML. In the next section, we're going to put these to work by building a custom game tile class, which will take in a sprite and a texture, and it will use it to display stuff there. Okay, so stay tuned for that. Thanks for watching. We'll see you guys in the next one. What's up guys, welcome back. In this section, we're going to start our Building the Game Map mini series. This is part one, in which we'll be focusing on the game tile class itself. We're going to be using these game tiles to construct our entire game map in an eight by eight grid. So in this section, we're going to first create the game tile class. We're going to create .h and .cpp files, where we'll add the attributes and function signatures in the .h, and then the actual functionality in the .cpp files. So this will be fairly straightforward. Let's head to the code and get started. All right, this is where we left off last time. We talked about textures and sprites. We actually don't need this code in here anymore because we're going to be moving it elsewhere, but we can keep it so that we can easily copy and paste it over and save some time. The next steps are going to be to create those two files, the .h and the .cpp, to represent our game tiles. So we'll create a new file here, and I'm just going to save it right away as my game tile .h. Okay, and I'm going to create another one and save that one as game tile.cpp like so whoops cpp okay cool so let's start in the game tile.h where we'll add our um, kind of signatures and everything first thing we'll need to do is get access to some sfml graphics stuff so we're going to do the hashtag include sfml slash graphics.hpp good stuff now we'll start up our class we'll call this game tile like so OK, and we're going to add in some uh, variables. So we'll make this public because these will be oops, don't want that. Um, these will be accessed from various points within the program, mostly likely um, from a game world kind of class, but we'll focus more on that a little bit later. So let's start by talking about what a game tile is going to need. For starters, it's probably going to need a position which will dictate where on the overall game map this particular tile exists. We can use actually an SF vector 2 f for that, like so, vector 2 f, and we'll call this the position or pos for short. A vector 2 f contains x and y values, so that makes it perfect for our purposes here. The next thing we'll need is going to be a texture and a sprite. The reason we need both the texture and the sprite is because we need a sprite to have a persistent texture attached to it. If we just had the sprite but no reference to the texture, we get this annoying white box problem. So we're going to do an SF texture, we'll just call this texture, and we're going to have an SF sprite, we'll just call this sprite like so. Okay, so looking pretty good so far. The next couple of things that we'll need are going to be two booleans, which will dictate whether or not we can pass through this particular tile. So whether it's a wall or it's passable ground. And the other, which will dictate whether or not it's an exit. Okay, so we'll just add these up top because these are kind of the simpler ones. We'll do is, let's call this is free to dictate whether or not we can actually move through it. And we'll have another boolean is exit like so. So basically, we're going to use this to determine whether or not we're dealing with an exit. So when the player moves to a new tile, if it is the exit, then we want to kind of reset everything and start a new game. If it's not the exit, then we'll just leave things alone. Is free will determine whether or not the user can actually pass over that particular tile. Some of the tiles are going to be walls, so we don't want the user passing through those. Some of them are just going to be free ground, in which case is free is going to be true. Perhaps is passable might actually be a better name. Um, in this case, this is going to be true, and the user can pass pass through so this is more for the movement functionality okay we'll only need two functions one will be the constructor so we'll call this one game tile um, it's going to need a string for the texture name so we'll do a standard string for that uh, let's just do that there 
it's going to need a float for the x and a float for the y. Alternatively, we could actually just pass in a vector 2f right away. Uh, we'll just pass in some floats, makes it a bit easier. And we'll do a boolean here for the it's passable and a boolean for is exit. Finally, I'm just going to add in a boolean return function, which is going to be called set texture. This is going to take in my standard string, and we're going to use this to set up the rest of the sprite. In fact, you know what? Let's call this setup set up sprite like so. So it can take in a string for the texture, and it's going to add and modify a few of the sprite attributes. We're going to need this because we will change things as we go. Uh, when the player moves around and the enemies move around the map, we're going to be updating these. So that's why it needs to be public. Otherwise, that should be almost good to go. The last things that we're going to add in are going to be our hashtag if and def. Um, and the uh, define and then the end ifs. So the reason we're doing that is because we are likely going to be accessing SFML graphics from multiple locations. And if we don't do this, then we get a bunch of annoying warnings and potentially errors. OK, so we need to do this for all of our dot H for our header files. All right, great stuff. So we can go ahead and give that a save and let's implement the functionality in game tile dot CPP. OK, the first thing that we want access to is this H file. So we're going to do hashtag include game uh, should be lowercase game tile dot h like so and then we're going to implement the actual functionality itself so starting with a constructor we'll do a game cell game cell because it's a game cell namespace we're going to do a standard uh, string we'll just call this texture name we're going to need a float for the x a float for the y and we're going to need a boolean for whether or not it's free so we'll call this uh, passable and we're also going to need a boolean for the exit, so we'll just call this exit. OK, cool. So um, besides this, we'll want to set up a couple of the attributes. And oh, actually, you know what? We call this game cell. This should actually be game tile. OK, that makes a lot more sense. OK, cool stuff. We're going to want to set the texture through the text name, but we'll get back to that. Let's set up the others, starting with the position. So we have a variable called pause, which is a vector to f. Essentially, what we can do is say pause is going to be equal to an sf vector to f. And we're going to pass in the x and the y values like so. And then we're going to set out, take our sprite, and we're going to set its position to that position there. OK, um, the set position function takes in a vector to f, in this case, x and y position. So that's perfect. We can also set up the other attributes, um, the passable and the exit. So we're just going to do is passable is going to be equal to passable. And oops, need the semicolon. And is exit is going to be equal to exit, like so. OK, so the last thing that we want to do is implement this function here called set up sprite. Go ahead and copy that over if we'd like. Um, this is going to need the game tile namespace. So game tile set up sprite. OK, it's going to need to take in the string, which we'll call texture name. OK, and then we can go ahead and set things up. So we'll say if not our actually, you know what? We have the code written in main.cpp. We can actually just take this, cuss it out and stick it back into here. OK, so we can get rid of that. We already have access to a texture. We want to load from a file, whatever texture name that we're passing in like so. Okay. If not, then we want to return false. Okay. Now we already have a sprite, so we don't need to set that up. We do want to smooth the edges of the texture. So we're actually going to take our texture that we just loaded, and we're going to set smooth equal to true. This will make sure that the edges are not blurry. We're going to set the texture of the sprite. We're going to set a texture rect. So we'll do sprite dot set texture rect. And we're going to pass in an SF int rect. 0, 0, and we'll do 50 by 50. This way we have um, the sprite textures themselves being 50 by 50. Our grid is 400 by 400, so that will give us access to an 8 by 8 grid of these tiles. And at the end, we're going to return true. Now we just want to call it from our constructor here. We're just going to say if set up sprite, or actually, you know what we'll do? We'll say if not set up sprite, and we'll pass in our texture name. Then we're simply going to return. Okay. 
And that is pretty much all we need to do. So we can give this a save. We can head on back to main. Um, and we're going to just get rid of this window.draw sprite because that's going to cause us problems otherwise. And that's pretty much it. So just to really, really quickly recap, in game tile, we need this to dictate whether or not we can walk through it. This dictate whether or not it's an exit. We have an X and Y position in the vector for the pause. We have a texture and a sprite for drawing, and then just a couple of setup functions. In game tile.cpp, we're setting everything up here. We're creating that vector 2f and setting the sprite position after we set up the sprite itself. Uh, we're taking in all of the attributes as parameters, and then our setup sprite here is just gonna take in the texture name, it's going to load it, and it's going to set it onto the sprite along with a couple of other attributes. In the next section we'll continue setting up our game world so stay tuned for that. Thanks for watching and see you guys in part two. Hello guys, welcome to part two of our building the game map subseries. Here we're going to start focusing on the game world itself. This is going to be a big class that contains most of the game's logic and functionality. We'll begin here with the initial and setup implementation by first creating the game world class, adding some of the necessary initial attributes in a .h file, and some of the initial functionality in the .cpp file. Now we'll be adding to this class and these files as we go, but let's get at least the initial setup stuff done in this section. Let's head to the code and begin. All right, last time we left off by implementing our game tile.h and the game tile.cpp classes. These are pretty much done, so we can leave them, leave them alone for now. We will want to start up another couple of files, and these are going to represent our game world.h and our game world.cpp. So we can save this as game world.h and this one as game world.cpp. Okay, game world.cpp. Good stuff. Okay, so let's focus on gameworld.h. We'll once again need access to graphics.hpp, so we're going to hashtag include that, uh, sfml slash graphics.hpp, cool stuff. Next up, we'll need access to the game cell.h file, because we'll need access to some game, or the game tile.h file rather, because we'll need access to the game tiles themselves. So we'll also do another hashtag include with the game tile.h like so. We don't need the game tile.cpp here. The access to the .h will be fine. One other thing we'll need because we'll want a list of tiles as a vector is going to be the access to the vector class. So we'll do vector like so. Okay, it's just much easier to work with vectors and they'll really have no effect on the performance versus just using a regular multi-dimensional array. Okay, so let's build up the game world class itself. Okay, game world like so. And before we go any further, I'm just going to do the if and defs and the defines um, just so I don't forget. So we'll do if and def game world underscore h. Same with define. And then finish up with the hashtag and if. Okay, good stuff. Note how we are using the sfml graphics.hpp here as well as in game tile.h. Okay, so that's kind of the main reason why we need these. All right, so let's get on to the attributes and the function signatures game world needs. Now we know that game world is going to contain pretty much all of the game's logic, functionality, and attributes. So this is gonna be a really long list by the end of it. Let's talk about the initial stuff. So we know that the game world is going to contain our map with a grid of tiles. So that tile grid is essentially gonna be a vector of vectors of these game tiles. So we can add that in now at least. So we're going to build up a vector of vectors of game tiles. So we'll do the game tile, and actually these need to be game tile pointers because we will need access to specific game tiles so that we can modify them as we go. Just a regular game tile copy won't cut it, okay? And we're going to call these tiles or cells. So we call these tiles like so. We might also want an attribute to tell us how long or how wide or high the grid is. So I'm going to create an int called grid length. Okay. Last but not least, we'll need a game world constructor, like so. And these all need to be public. So we're going to add the public keyword like that. Okay, so we'll also need a bunch of private stuff. Um, realistically, we'll need a lot 
of stuff in here, but we're just going to add in again the initial setup stuff. So we'll need positions as vectors that will represent the exit, the player, and eventually the enemy positions. We'll just add in the exit and the player for now so that we can draw them. And uh, you know what, actually, I guess we can add in the enemy positions as well. We may as well do that. So we'll do a vector for the exit pause. This one's not going to be a vector to F, this will be a vector to I, because we want to be able to get the X and Y values and directly translate them into indices in our tiles. So we'll call this one exit pause. And we're going to do exit pause again as a vector to I because we need X and Y values. We'll need one for the player position or the player pause. And we'll actually need an array of these for the enemy positions. So we'll just go, we're just going to paste this, but instead of an SF vector to I, this is going to be a vector of vector to I's like this. Standard uh, vector. And the type is going to be vector to I's. And then we'll call this enemy positions or enemy pauses for short if you'd like. So again, X and Y coordinate for the exit position, for the player position, as well as the enemy positions. Because we're going to have multiple enemies, I think by the end we'll have three, we'll need a list or a vector of these X and Ys. And so that way we can keep track of all of the enemies. We also want a few functions that will help us just to set up the initial state. Uh, maybe we'll call this one something like set up initial state. Okay, we'll want this to be a separate function of its own because when we go to reset things, we can simply call this again to reset the entire map. We'll also want a couple functions to help us to set up the enemy positions and set up the basic tiles. So we'll call this one set up enemy positions, just because I like to separate out the, set the individual piece of functionality into their own functions, and then want to set up tiles like so. Okay, so I think we have enough to be going off of for now. We can now turn to the game world.cpp and start implementing some of this functionality at least. So the first thing I'll need to do is hashtag include the game world.h of course. And then we'll start with the constructor. So we'll do game world, game world like so. Okay, as you can, if you remember, this is going to take in no parameters just yet. So we can leave this as is initially um, as far as the parameters go we will need to set up a couple things the first is going to be the grid length we're going to set to be eight okay next up we're going to make a call to that our function which will help us to set up the initial state so we may as well make that function call now set up initial state like so okay and that will be the next function which we implement so i'm just going to copy this and let's create that function so void game world set up initial state oh weird um, just going to get rid of that. Okay, and let's set this guy up. Okay, so within this function, we'll want to set up the exit and the player position vectors because the exit position vector will be needed for collision detection. And the player position, of course, we'll have to keep track of the player, so we'll need that too. Now, I've actually hard-coded in the start positions of the player and the exit. Feel free to change these up later on if you'd like. Probably best to stick with what I have, and then, like I said, later on, you can mix things up if you'd like. So I'm actually going to set my exit position to an SF vector to I and we're going to do one and zero. This way it's the X position of one and the Y position of zero. So basically top row and then one in from the left. And I think that's a vector with a capital I, a uh, capital V rather. Okay, so we have the exit position. Now we'll want the player position. So we're going to do the player pause is going to be equal to a ve another vector to I. This one, we're actually going to start all the way down at the bottom right. So we're going to do grid length minus one, and then grid length minus one. Okay, this way it will start all the way down in the bottom right at seven and seven. Again, because we're using indexes, then this should be appropriate. The next thing that we'll want to do is set up the enemy positions. So we'll have a void game world, oops, uh, game world set up enemy positions. I don't know why that comes up as inaccessible because it definitely is accessible. Okay, and we'll want to call that from our setup initial state. So we're going to do set up enemy positions. Okay, and also before we implement this, I'm just going to finish off by adding up our function call to set up the tiles. So we're going to do void game world set up tiles. 
Okay, and again, we're not going to set up the tiles just yet. We're actually going to implement that in the next section, but good to add the function here because we'll need to call that here. Um, so set up tiles as well. Cool. Now I've also hard coded in some positions for the enemy or rather the enemies. The first thing that we'll want to do is actually um, clear out the current vector. So we're going to do the enemy positions dot clear like so and then we're just going to push back a couple of vectors so we're going to do enemy positions dot push back okay and I'm going to push back my SF vector to I okay and I'm just going to pass in again some hard-coded values so I found for the map that I have set out we'll do 0 2 copy and paste we'll do 6 0 and finally we'll do 2 and 7 so this might not make as much sense now, but once you see the map, you'll see exactly why I've chosen these positions. All right, so we'll actually now head on over to the next section, in which we'll implement the cells and all the tiles rather, and all of this will become a lot more apparent. All right, so thanks for watching, and see you guys in part three. What is up, guys? Welcome to part three of our Building the Game Map subseries. Here we're going to finish this off by constructing our game map from scratch. This will essentially be a bunch of tiles in an 8x8 grid format. So our first task is going to be to build the map as a 2D list of game tiles. We're going to use vectors for this. We'll need to basically build up each row of 8 tiles, so 8x8. Eight eight. That's going to be 64 tiles in total. We'll go through a couple rows together, so I'll show you kind of the structure and how to set these game cells up, and then we'll leave you guys on your own to either follow my structure or build up your own maps, and then by the end we'll run the game so that we can view the complete map. So let's head to the code and get started. Okay, so last time we finished by adding the initial setup of our game world for the most part. The only thing that is left to do is fill up our setup tiles. And then by the end, I'll go back and kind of explain exactly why we chose these positions for the enemies, as well as for the exit and the player positions. Okay, so um, in our setup tiles, the first thing that we we'll want to do is clear all of the tiles because we're going to be pushing a bunch onto the stack. So we'll get our tiles and we're going to call the clear function. Okay, so the first thing that we'll need to do is create a new row because again, our tiles is a vector of vectors. Um, where is it? It's right here. So we'll need to build up each row as a vector of these game tiles. And then we'll need to do that eight times and add each of those to our overall vector, which will represent the complete matrix of tiles. Okay, so like I said, I'll go through the first couple with you and then leave you guys to do it on your own. So we'll do a vector of game cells except these need to be game cell pointers, okay? Because again, we do need to, or game tiles rather, we do need to be able to reference a specific tile. So that's why we need the pointer for it. Okay, and we'll just call this first row. Okay, so in order to create a new game cell, we do something like this. Uh, we're going to actually just put this right in the first row dot pushback function. We're going to create a new game tile Okay, and this is going to need several different um, parameters. So the first is going to be the name of the texture that we're going to use. This will always be images slash something. Um, in our case, if we go to our images folder and open that up, we can either use a wall for impassable terrain, ground for passable terrain, the door for the exit, the enemy for obviously an enemy, and then the player for the player. So um, for now, we'll stick with a wall. So we'll do wall.png just to see what it looks like by the end. Okay, um, we want this to actually, yes, okay, we want the comma there. Um, we want this to be 0, 0 because it's going to be the very first tile in the top left. So x of 0, y of 0. And we want this to be impassable. And it's not going to be an exit, so we'll set false and false. Okay, and then at the end, we'll just close it off with a semicolon. So let's just close that. Okay, so you can see that I've got my first row. Again, keep in mind, this is just going to be the first eight tiles at the very top. I'm going to push back a new tile. So this will basically take this row and it's going to push a new tile onto the end of it. So the tile that will push will be this new game tile. We'll have, again, the string, which is going to be images slash wall.png. That's going to be the name of where the file is located. It's going to be at position 0, 0. And false and false because it's impassable. It's just a wall and we don't want it to be an exit. Okay, cool. So we're just going to copy this and we're going to paste it to do the second tile. So again, I'm pushing it back onto the first row. 
This one is actually going to be the door. I want this to be the exit because I want it to be a wall and then an exit and then some walls and then there's going to be an enemy and then some more walls. So for this I'm going to replace the wall with a door .png. This one is actually going to be at 50 and 0 because remember each of these tiles will be 50 by 50 and I have 0, 0 so the next over will be 50 and still 0 because still a y of 0 and an x of 50. Okay, so it's the next tile over, that's why it's 50 and 0. This one is going to be passable because it's the exit and it is an exit so we need to change that to true. Okay, so the next one, the next few actually, are just going to be walls. So I'm just going to copy this and paste it. Um, it's going to be a wall. It's now going to be 100 because again, 0, 50, 100, 150, and so on and so forth. And these are all impassable. And actually the next uh, four will set to be impassable too. So 150, 200, 250, and then we'll actually want an enemy. Oh, that's 150. 250, okay, and we'll want an enemy. So I'm actually going to copy this and paste it here. Okay, and actually, you know what, I'll zoom out so you guys can see the whole thing. Okay, um, instead of the door, this is now going to be the enemy.png. Set this to be 300. It is passable, but it's not an exit. So we'll do true for passable, but false because it's an ex It's not an exit. Okay, and then we'll finish off with one more wall on the corner. So we'll do images slash wall, and this should be at 350. It's going to be false and false. Okay, at the very end of this, we're going to do the cells dot push back and we're just going to push back the entire first row and I don't know why I keep saying cells it should be tiles there we go good stuff all right so let's get on to the second row and then we can run it to see what it looks like and then we'll leave you guys on your own to build up the final thing so I'm just going to copy this and I'm going to paste it all here I'm going to call this my second row Okay, and I'm just going to replace all those first rows with the second row because, of course, we're adding it to the second row and then pushing that back. Okay, so this is again the first row of tiles, eight tiles. Second row of tiles will be just below that, then the third, and so on and for so forth until the eighth. Okay, so we want to change things up a bit. Um, basically, we want a bunch of um, floors, I think we called them. Uh, so let's just double check. Yep, we called these, oh, um, this was just ground. Okay, so the ground is going to be traversable tiles so it will change this to ground okay and I want basically most of this to be traversable okay so I'm just going to copy and paste these all um, pretty much actually these should all be traversable here that means that um, because they're traversable I need to change this attribute to true for each of these because if you remember, um, the, this first false or true is whether or not it is passable. But none of these are going to be exits, so I'm just going to change all of those to false. So make sure all of these are false. And this one is false because this is just a wall, but the others are all ground. They're all traversable ground, so we're going to set those to true. The next thing that we need to change here is going to be this. The, so the X positions are all going to remain the same, so 0, 50, 100, 150, etc. But the Y positions are now all 50 because this is the second row down. So we had all zeros at the top. Now all 50s, the next one will be all 100s, 150s, and so on and so forth. So I'm just going to copy and paste that. And actually, let's just do this. Probably a bit easier. All right, now doing this for all eight rows is going to be extremely tedious, and I'm sure you don't want to watch me do that. So I'm actually going to pause my recording, fill out the other six rows, and then when it's done, we can come back and work on the actual drawing. All right, so we're done. We now have all eight rows of tiles complete. Um, so feel free to kind of pause and give these a look through if you'd like. Otherwise, I'm just going to quickly jump on over to main.cpp. We're going to draw them out, and then hopefully that'll help you to kind of map the tiles to the specific um, locations in the window. So what we're going to do is start a double for loop so we can loop through the array of um, game tiles. We'll actually need to, um, just above, create an instance of our game world. So we're going to say game world and actually I guess we'll probably need the import too. So we're just going to start with a hashtag include uh, game world dot cpp okay because we need that game world functionality we're going to create a game world here game world is going to be equal to a new game world like so um, no parameters or arguments necessary okay and then we're going to again use that double for loop like so we're going to say for int i equals zero i less than game world dot grid length okay and we'll do i plus plus 
Okay, and we'll do basically the same thing. So we'll just copy and paste this for int j equals zero, j less than grid uh, game world dot grid length, j plus plus. We're going to do the let's just put that in. We're going to do window dot draw. We're going to draw the game world dot tiles, and we're going to do i and j, and then we're going to draw the sprite specifically from that. Okay, so essentially we're looping through all the rows and then all the columns and then drawing the, guessing the specific tile and then drawing the sprite at that tile. Okay, we'll go ahead and save this, turn to terminal, we'll compile it, make sure everything's good to go. And it looks like we are missing one of the imports. Oh yes, okay, so we need to import the game tile.cpp as well. I will give that a save, should be able to recompile it. And then we should be good to go. So we'll do dot slash main and now you can see your little game here. All right, so what I would try to do if I were you is go to our game world.cpp, um, try to match each of these tiles to its specific location here. Map the player, walls, enemies, floors, and door. And feel free to play around and build your own worlds if you'd like. Otherwise, that is it for now. When we come back, we're going to be working on the player movement. So stay tuned for that. Thanks for watching. I will see you guys in the next one.